Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to GAN, Global Atheist News, our weekly review of how religion impacts humanity. This week's headlines. In Afghanistan, the Taliban are warned against targeting former security forces, and the Taliban declare women free, but rights activists see little cause to celebrate. The Liverpool bomber turns out to be a Muslim. A Pakistani mob kills a Sri Lanka man over blasphemy accusations. Contaminated Zamzam holy water from Mecca is sold in the UK. Muslim scientists make a groundbreaking discovery on why it doesn't rain. A Muslim cleric leaves Islam and switches to humanism. Rabbi Tovia Singer exposes a monumental error in the New Testament. A plumber was working on a toilet at Joel Osteen's church then a trove of cash and checks fell out of the wall. 500 plus Hindus threaten mass self-immolation over a comedy show. Monthly church going suits worshippers better post COVID. New Zealand pushes to have indigenous knowledge taught on a parity with modern science. Another anti-vax preacher has got COVID and religion is booming on TikTok and Instagram. Hi, this is Nouria Khan with Global Atheist News Islamic Affairs Report. The USA and a host of allied countries have called on the Taliban to end the targeted killings of former members of Afghan security forces. In a joint statement, the 22 nations demanded that the Islamist regime respect its pledge not to harm former government or security personnel. We are deeply concerned by the reports of summary killings and enforced disappearances, the statement says. It follows a damning report on killings and abductions by the Islamist regime. Released by the Human Rights Watch earlier this week, the report documented more than a hundred executions and abductions of former Afghan government officials since the Taliban took control of the country almost four months ago. This is despite the regime's assurance that the previous government workers would not be harmed. Afghanistan's Taliban rulers have issued a special decree outlining women's rights under their regime, but getting an education or a job are not amongst them. The decree attributed to Taliban Supreme Leader Mullah Habaitullah Akhundzada bans child marriage and states that no one can force a woman to marry by coercion or pressure. The Taliban have allowed very few women, with the exception of medical workers, to continue their work. Many professional women have fled the country or given up on their careers and girls and young women have not been allowed to return to school beyond the elementary years. Keeping girls out of school, warned the UNICEF director in last month's report, was likely to fuel the problem of child marriage. As most teenage girls are still not allowed to go back to school, the risk of child marriage is now even higher. Education is often the best protection against negative coping mechanisms such as child marriage and child labour, the report said. Since retaking Afghanistan this summer, the Taliban's leaders have been pushing Western governments for formal recognition as the legitimate rulers of the country. No foreign states have recognised the Taliban government so far. Many experts and rights activists see the decree on Friday as being aimed more at other countries than it is at affording Afghan women any real rights. The Taliban are just posturing for international attention and recognition. Dr. Bahal Jalali, a former professor at the American University of Afghanistan, told CBS News. They want to make it appear as if they will gradually soften their approaches and become more open regarding women's rights. It's, of course, not sincere. It is just a ploy to make themselves appear more moderate. In response to the decree, a group of women's rights activists held a gathering in Kabul on Sunday. 
Fearing reprisals from the Taliban, the event was held indoors. The participants expressed their dissatisfaction over the decree, calling on the United Nations and the international community to, to pay close attention to women's rights in Afghanistan. The Taliban's decree summarizes all of the women's rights only in the context of marriage and shows that the Taliban's thinking when it comes to women does not go beyond the home, housekeeping and marriage, Huda Khamosh, one of the organizers of the event, told CBS News. The Liverpool bomber turns out to be a Muslim. Haris Sultan and I report in this video. The Dawa folk were eagerly saying the Liverpool bomber was a Christian convert. Turns out he stopped attending church after a few months and was con constantly in the mosque in the run up to the attack. Yeah, so this is so yeah. they found out. Have we? Uh, I know we spoke about it, but we were, we didn't know his identity at that time. So this is what like two weeks ago now, three weeks ago when this happened. Yeah, well, so, so do basically, we have any more information? Yeah, because stop selling man is is right. Basically, they've they've launched an investigation now into this because they they realize that there's a lot of people who are potentially abusing the system. So, in the sense that they're playing the religious card just to stay in the UK and not be deported back to like stricter Muslim countries, which would penalize them for their you know change of religion. But obviously, these people are you know in a really really bad situation. They will do anything to start a new life in this country and unfortunately that includes lying um so yeah it, this is actually a huge problem and at least like finally now mps are also realizing it but um they are going to actually do an inquiry into this because i think it was called the alpha something course which is the course that he claims to have done to convert to christianity there is now the spotlight being put on on um organizations like that um but as far as like the I think the people he was a tenant with for a good like couple of months, they fully did believe uh, that he was a Christian. He would pray with them every night um, and he attended church and things like that. But definitely you can tell that, you know, this is in a way it is a form of, I would go as far as to say, Harris, it is a kind of like a form of Dakia um, because you, you literally are pretending that you've converted to another religion just to get something favorable to help you ultimately carry out your your general mission but obviously he got denied asylum and um it wasn't even considered by the court apparently and therefore he wanted to you know um take out revenge and it, it, he was actually on his way to the cathedral anyway so that just goes to show you even more that you know his loyalty is clearly still lay with islam a Muslim mob in eastern Pakistan lynched a Sri Lankan man Friday before burning his body for allegedly insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Police identified the victim as Priyantha Kumara, saying he was working as an export manager at a private sports equipment factory in Sialkot, an industrial city in the country's most populous Punjab province. A co-worker reportedly accused the slain for foreigner of desecrating and removing posters from factory walls bearing the name of the Prophet Muhammad before informing others about the alleged blasphemy act. Witnesses and area police officers said factory workers quickly gathered in large numbers and fatally attacked Komara inside the facility. They later dragged his body to a nearby road and torched it. Hassan Khawar, the Punjab government spokesman, told reporters while sharing details of the incident. Police say they had already rounded up more than 100 people in connection with the violence and security camera video was being used to identify other suspects. Prime Minister Imran Khan said the horrific vigilante attack was a day of shame for Pakistan. Khan said he was personally overseeing the investigations and vowed to bring those responsible to justice. A BBC investigation discovered Zamzam water was being sold by Muslim bookshops in Wandsworth, South West London and Upton Park, East London, as well as in Luton uh, in Bedfordshire. The water is poisonous, particularly because of the high levels of arsenic, which is a carcinogen, said Dr Duncan Campbell, president of the Association of Public Analysts. The BBC asked a pilgrim to take samples from the taps which were linked to the Zamzam well to buy bottles on sale in Mecca and compare the water on sale illegally with the genuine source. These showed high levels of nitrate and potentially harmful bacteria and traces of arsenic at three times the permitted maximum level, just like the illegal water which was purchased in the UK. Secret recordings captured the vendors describing customers who drank it daily. 
They depend on it. They don't drink anything else, said the owner of an Islamic bookshop in Upton Park. Last year, the Food Standard Agency said people should consider avoiding the drink in the UK, which said it came from dubious sources. Dr. Yunus Ramadan Tainas, an environmental health officer who has previously warned about Zamzam water, said it was a sensitive matter. People see this as holy water, he added. They find it difficult to accept that it's contaminated, but the authorities in Saudi Arabia or in the UK must take action. A popular Muslim in Jagawa state has secretly left Islam but refuses to come out for fear of losing his family and threats to his life. Ustaz Mukhtar Yunus, not his real name, has been leading prayers in one of the major mosques in the state and going by the kind of respects he earns in his community, he opts to hide his conviction and continue to pray with his Muslim adherents in order to continue to care for his families. Citing his reason to leave Islam but deciding to hide his identity, he said he had consciously parted ways with Islam due to the countless examples of contradictory verses and hadiths that promote hatred, wars, slavery and dogmatic fellowship. Islam survives on fear inserted in the hearts of its followers. With common sense, Islam or religions in general can't last anymore, unless it blends with our cultures, he said. Explaining his decision to secretly live with Muslims, he said culture and fear are the major factors. I have a wife and children. They could be targeted or subjected to discrimination. I have relatives who will pose a threat to my life. In fact, our culture has blended with Islam in such a way that our lives are deeply attached to Islam, he added. We welcomed him to a new order that promotes love, freedom and human dignity. We also promised to never reveal his secret or engage with any trolls that could expose him. Somebody has written Muhammad on babies' nappies, called diapers in America, in Pakistan. And now that's why there's a drought, claim Muslims. Please see this video. हमने कहा कि सोशल मीडिया की खबरें हो सकती है हमें उससे यकीन नहीं आया लेकिन आज जब हमने मार्केट के अंदर क्या बोले डायपरों को चेक करने की कोशिश की जो जो भी डायपर निकाला खासकर पेंपर्स की जो कंपनी है इसके जितने भी डायपर हमने निकाले उन सब पर वादे तौर पर मोहम्मद रसूलुल्लाह सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम का नाम लिखा हुआ है इसलिए तमाम अहले इस्लाम से हमारी गुजारिश है कि खुदारा खुदारा अपने छोटे-छोटे बच्चों से मोहम्मद रसूलुल्लाह सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम की तौहीन मत करवाएं मत करवाएं मोहम्मद रसूलुल्लाह सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम की तौहीन इस वक्त जो बादशाह बन है इस वक्त जो बरकमन है इस वक्त जो खुदा हमसे रूठा हुआ है उसकी सबसे बड़ी वजह यह है कि मोहम्मद रसूलुल्लाह सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम की गुस्ताखी आज मुसलमान भी बेखबरी के आलम कर रहा है इसलिए सभी तमाम आलम इस्लाम के मुसलमानों से गुजारिश की जाती है जो भी चीज इस्तेमाल करें उसको सौ मरतबा चेक करें कहीं हजूर अक्रम सल्लाह की गुस्ताखी न हो रही हो वसलम एंड नाउ बैक टू यू जॉन Thank you, Nuria. Rabbi Tovia Singer exposed a monumental blunder in the New Testament. It seems that the author of the Gospel of Luke's knowledge of the Holy Land was appalling. See this video. Mind-blowing. I don't know if in all my years and I've been broadcasting a long time. I don't know if anyone ever asked that question before. And what I'm about to say, you will definitely have heard of. So what he's talking about is the Mar Samach Pela. I should just translate that. And the Mar Samach Pela is the tomb in which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried along with their wives. Rachel is buried in Beis Lechem in Bethlehem, okay? So that's in Hebron. Hebron, so you just understand logistically, I can walk to Hebron from Jerusalem. It's really close. It's a, it, you have to pass Bethlehem to get to Hebron, but if you're looking at a map, it's all in Judea. It's like right in the same thing. I mean, it would be a whole day walk to, to walk there, but it's really close, okay? That's where the tomb of the patriarchs there, and that's where hundreds of thousands of people visit every year. I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah are buried there. That's big. It's the, it's the building it's in, the building it's in today is one of the oldest operational buildings in the entire world. 
It was built, the outer structure today is 2,000 years old, was built by Herod. So this is a really important place. It's the second holiest place in all of the, in all the world after Jerusalem. Now, the reason why this setup is vital is you often hear from Christian apologists that you could tell from Luke that he had an intimate familiarity with the land of Israel. He knew there were sycamore trees over here, and they do the oak trees here, and if you go like this, there was a tree, and there was a cloud. They knew what kind of coin they were using. You see, Luke, he had such a knowledge of what was going on in Israel at the time. He knew if somebody coughed, he knew which way to say, Gesundheit. He knew <laughs> every... You hear, I hear this, and I'm going, the author of Luke knew so little that he didn't know where the Mar Samach is, where the Tomb of the Patriarchs is. And he places the Tomb of the Patriarchs not in Hebron, which is, as I said, just south of Jerusalem. It's really close. But in Shechem, like 100 kilometers north, like way off. That's not like Long Island is not technically part of New York City, but it's like really close, and you can say, I'm from New York. No, it's nothing like that. It's Shechem. Modern day, it's called Nablus. That's a monument. It's not, it's not an error. You, you can't, if somebody says that the Empire State Building is in San Diego, then you know, <laughs> you pretty much know that this, you know. this person has <laughs> no idea. I mean, Shechem is up in the north, way up in, Shechem, all the way up in Samaria. Shechem is in the heart of the Holy Land, in the heart of Judea. Do not argue that the author of Luke was intimately familiar with the land of Israel. Stop that. A plumber doing maintenance work at Pastor Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church stumbled across checks and cash hidden in a wall, a discovery that may yield clues to an unsolved burglary reported by the congregation seven years ago. Back in 2014, Lakewood Church, led by Austin and his wife, Victoria, reported to police the loss of more than $600,000 in a burglary. See this video. Now to developments in a story that KPRC2 has been tracking for years now. Hundreds of thousands of dollars reported missing from Lakewood Church may have been found in a bathroom wall of the church. I mean, it may sound hard to believe, and the claim made on a radio show is raising eyebrows all over Houston. We're talking about a $600,000 reported theft here. KPRC 2's Rochelle Turner talked to one of the DJs who heard the claim this morning. Rochelle, this is just simply wow, pretty unbelievable. Christine, Andy, wow, crazy. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh, really? Yes, that is what many people are going to be thinking once they watch this story. A plumber just doing his job at Lakewood Church discovered an undisclosed amount of money. It was the craziest phone call we've ever had. Meet George Lindsay. He's the morning show co-host for the morning bullpen at 100.3 The Bull. It's the greatest job ever. This morning, the co-host asked people about valuable things they found and received a call from a plumber who recently did some work at Lakewood Church. There was a loose toilet in the wall, and uh, we removed the tile. Well, they removed the tile. Uh, went to go remove the toilet. And I moved some insulation away, and uh, about 500 envelopes fell out of the wall. And I was like, oh, wow. Back in 2014, the mega church made headlines after someone stole $600,000. Obviously, this case remains under investigation. Seven years later, a man fixing a toilet at the church discovered money in the walls. I went ahead and uh, contacted the uh, maintenance supervisor that was there. And uh, I went ahead and turned it all in. In a statement, Lakewood Church said recently while repair work was being done at Lakewood Church, an undisclosed amount of cash and checks were found. Lakewood immediately notified the Houston Police Department and is assisting them with their investigation. HPD has not confirmed if the money stolen years ago and the money found by the plumber are related. But Lindsay says investigators would have never known about the money if it wasn't for the plumber who discovered it. There's still 
a lot of questions. If it's that money, why did they never go back and get that money? It's like I said, it's like a movie. I really think I could make a 10 part series on Netflix out of it. And it's still unclear at this hour just how much money that plumber found at the church. It's something that I'm working to get answers for you at 6 o'clock. But a few years ago, when we first reported this story, Crime Stoppers was offering a $25,000 reward. Coming up at 6, you'll hear what the caller had to say when he was asked about that reward. For now, reporting live in Southwest Houston, I'm Rochelle Turner, KPRC 2 News. Wow, all right. On November the 14th, a comedy club in Goa cancelled controversial comedian Manawar Faruqi's sold-out show after over 500 Hindus threatened to set themselves on fire if he was allowed to perform. Faruqi became an international symbol of India's suppression of free expression earlier this year when he and four other artists were arrested for allegedly making indecent remarks against Hindu deities. Despite the police openly acknowledging that they had no evidence that Faruqi told such jokes, he spent 35 days in jail. The case against him was motivated by people from his Muslim background. After his release, extreme right-wing Hindu groups have continued to target Faruqi over his stand-up comedy, and numerous shows have been cancelled after credible threats. Earlier this month, the Hindutva vigilante gang Bajrang Dal threatened to burn down a Mumbai venue if Faruqi continued his performance. Church attendance in England has fallen by a third since before the pandemic. Many regular worshippers have been attending only monthly since in-person services resumed this summer. For its report, Changing Church, the Evangelical Alliance surveyed 552 church leaders and 1,676 church members over 10 days in October. Average attendance has fallen by 32% the study finds. The decline in regular attendance is also reflected in volunteering and financial giving. Nearly two thirds of church leaders reported a reduction in both, and most expected a further decline in giving over the next few months. Youth and children's ministry has also been significantly reduced from pre-pandemic levels. A quarter of churches reported that they were no longer offering youth ministry and 17% were no lo longer offering any children's ministry. The lead theology researcher at the Evangelical Alliance, Rich Powney, said, the church continues to face a changing and at times challenging landscape. Yet this is also an opportunity to reflect and reset, to ask strategic questions and hold formative conversations as we learn some lessons from lockdown. Let's pray that we all remain committed to making Jesus known through our words and actions. In New Zealand, the government is trying to insert something called Matoranga into science courses. Matoranga means the knowledge system of the Maori. It includes references to various gods. For example, Tain, the god of the forest, is said to be the creator of humans and of all plants and creatures in the forest. Rain happens when the goddess Papatuan Nuku sheds tears. Maori try to claim that they have always been scientists. Their political demand is that Maturanga must be acknowledged as the equal of Western science, and that without this, Maori children will continue to fail in science at school. New Zealand is in the midst of a campaign to teach Maori ways of knowing 
alongside science as science on a par with modern science. The reason for this is to give Maori credibility, not just as indigenous people with moral and legal rights, but to validate their pseudo-scientific views. Scholars who object to this parity are in the process of being cancelled. For months now, Christian nationalist hate preacher Joshua Feuerstein has been spreading COVID lies to anyone who will listen. See this video. Listen to me. I understand and let me speak now to the cameras around the world, to every pastor that's watching this broadcast, to every Christian that has cowered in your home. I realize that for this last year that maybe you've been fed fear and fear and fear, but the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. You have a sound mind. You don't have to wear the mask. You got Jesus. You don't need the vaccine. You got Jesus. Yesterday, Feuerstein was due to deliver a sermon for a congregation in Knoxville, Tennessee, but he didn't turn up. He called in to apologize for his absence giving the reason as COVID. Who'd have thought it? Religion is booming on TikTok. See this video. Religion is adapting to new social media trends fast. Short videos like these are becoming really popular. On TikTok, this hashtag has 9 billion views. Diwali has over 2 billion. The hashtag Islam, more than 60 billion hits. I'm Sister Orianne Pietro Renee. And I'm Sister Danielle Victoria, and we are hashtag media, media nuns. These nuns dedicate their entire lives to Jesus Christ. But after they're finished praying, this is what they get up to. They're making a video on TikTok. We gotta go, we gotta go. We gotta go, we gotta go. Don't you think that some people might not take you seriously? I think there's a lot of stereotypes about nuns out there. <laughs> there's an idea that you lock yourself into an institution, like all the rules, all that you're giving up, you will therefore be miserable. So when we share those videos, we really want to show that we are human and we live. It's not to say that like we just play games all day, but that is a real part of our life. There's nothing inauthentic about it. And to say they have fun is an understatement. They do pranks. <laughs> or jump on the latest TikTok trend. What kind of comments do you get? <laughs> oh, they range. Yeah, they range. <laughs> they range. <laughs> they express comments of, um, I thought that nuns were all 90 years old and rigid and angry. There's like a whole strand of folks who are like, I don't even know how I got on nun talk. Like, how did I end up here? But I'm here to stay. The nuns pray for everyone who comments on their videos. Would you pray for someone who's left a hateful comment? Oh, oh more. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, watch out. Yeah, <laughs> we, we put our senior sisters on those comments. Free Thought Hour, my live Q&A show with this week's guest, The Lone Skeptic. We'll be starting in a few minutes, so stay tuned to this channel. Come and join in, especially if you are in the closet for fear of being shunned. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news review at the same time next week. Please like, subscribe, share, comment, set the notifications, etc. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.